Text and Logo, Chafee College. Wignall Museum of Contemporary Art. A graphic of a house appears. Text, Home Edition. Artist Talk, Jaime Munoz. May 10, 2021 from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. PDT. Thank you for joining us at today's program featuring artist Jaime Munoz, presented as part of the Wignall Museum's Home Edition. A video conference appears. A speaker in front of a blurred background. Text, Rebecca Trawick. Home Edition is a series of curated artist talks, workshops, and discussions featuring artists and cultural workers. My name is Rebecca Trawick, and I serve as the director and curator of the Wignall Museum. Text and logo, Wignall Museum, followed by text. The Wignall Museum is a teaching museum, an interdisciplinary art space that introduces Chafee College students, faculty, staff, and community members to innovative contemporary art objects and ideas. By fostering critical thinking, visual literacy, discourse, and empathy, the museum seeks to enhance the intellectual and cultural life of our community. We wanna take a moment to recognize that we are situated on the Ranch of Cucamonga campus of Chafee College, which resides on the traditional and unceded lands of the Tongva people. To learn more about native land acknowledgement, please visit https colon slash slash usdac slash native land https colon slash slash native dash land dot ca we offer our recognition and respect to the elders both past present and future a video conference with six speakers appears followed by one speaker roman stolenwick in front of a blank background hello my name is roman stolenwick i'm assistant curator at the wignall museum text with a link please visit us at www.chafee.edu slash wignall to access our full schedule of programs and available recordings when possible, recordings remain available on our website. Announcements post to our email subscribers and social media when new videos are available. All recordings on our site include captions and audio descriptions as options. Text, receive announcements about our programs. Subscribe to our email list, www.chafe.edu slash wignall slash about dash us.php. You can follow us on social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Wignall Museum. Visit our website About Us page if you'd like to sign up to receive email announcements. And we also ask that you complete a brief survey after the session at www.tinyurl.com slash Wignall. Text with a link to the survey. survey. Thank you. A speaker with a digital background of the Wignall campus. Text, Andrew Hadel. And hello everyone, my name is Andy Hadel. I am the preparator at the museum. Text. This program is a 20-minute presentation followed by questions and discussion. In a moment, Jaime Munoz will present his work. Any time remaining after the presentation will be available for Q&A. Rebecca Trawick. Thanks, Roman and Andy. So today I have the pleasure to introduce our guest artist, Jaime Munoz. Jaime Munoz was born in Los Angeles and received a BA in Fine Arts at UCLA in 2016. The visual language of his work is focused on aspects of identity, the commodic commodification of labor, religion, and the critique of Latin American colonialism and modernism. He is inspired by concepts of blood memory, the relationship that ancestral ties have to the present day experience. He is also inspired by the concept of Toyoteria, which is the working class shared experience through economic necessity around the R series Toyota mini fork trucks. A driving force in his technique is inspired by decorative aspects of common everyday life and ordinary objects found in his community. Munoz currently lives and works in Pomona, California. Jaime is also a graduate of Chafee College, so we're delighted to have him with us today. Please join me in giving Jaime a warm virtual welcome. Thanks, Jaime. A speaker in a studio with a blank canvas behind. Text, Jaime Munoz. Thank you for having me. Uh, it, it, it feels really good to like circle back like where I started in like my art career um and um I, I i appreciate the the invite and look forward to to sharing what i've been working on since since then a slideshow begins a piece of art appears it resembles the back side of a playing card dark red and brown in color the image is divided into four quadrants vertically symmetrical which come together to form a statue each quadrant is adorned in the middle with a white rose. Starting off with, with this piece right here. Um, th this was a work that I made in 2019. And I'm starting off with this work because um, it, it, it's, it's a, a work that kind of started like this new body of work that I'm currently working on. 
where I was kind of where I'm where I'm focusing on like one aspect of my interests in my art. And th this one in particular is um, basically um, looking at religiosity from like the colonial period and really examining aspects of my identity, looking at like the contradiction that that, that exists in that history and, and in, in myself. Jaime Munoz. Uh, but, but before, before I, I go there, I, I, I just want to talk about um, like my background first, because um, like my background in art, because all of that is very informative of how I construct my compositions and my concepts and the meaning on, on in, 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 in my work. So um, the six speakers, I, I'm not sure if, if, if you guys know, but, but my background originally was in commercial art. Like the majority of my time spent at Chafee, I was in the graphic design program. And um, like d during, during my time studying that, like, I've, I've always been fascinated about, how can I say it? Like the, um, like kind of like prop, like aggressive advertising where, where you, you're seeing artists commissioned to push an idea or a belief to, to sell something. And I feel like when, when you look at that contem contemporary times, it, it's, it's easy to identify. Cause when you look at like hyper-capitalism, it's all around us. Jaime Munoz. Um, but it's also interesting to see what, like, where that existed in the arts, like before the um, modernity, like when you look at like specifically what I look at, um, what I've been looking at recently um, in the like Latin American colonial art, like I, I see it in this in the same vein, like commissioned artists to kind of push an idea or a belief on an agenda. So the artwork reappears. So with, with this work, I was starting off with uh, the the image of La Virgen de Guadalupe which is, um, you know, her image exists in, in, in popular culture, you know, that, that's beyond just the confines of, of, of the church, you know? And I've, I've always felt like that was kind of like radical how like her image was designed to, to depending on your sources, either educate or colonize a, a, a native people, you know? But then at the same time, like once it enters in the fear of popular culture, like the people kind of can navigate and dictate how they relate to that. And that, that's, that's how, how, how I relate with all the religious iconography that I grew up with. And like the, the, the tension that I felt later on understanding like the history of, of, of colonization and like spirituality and capitalism and then the, mod, the modernist period and, and just really exploring a lot of different avenues from that. So, so, so in this work, um, like, like I mentioned, the bottom half is La Virgen de Guadalupe, who, who, who was really modeled after um, uh, the Mexica earth goddess Tonantzi, or, 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 or Cuatlicue, um, who is an earth goddess. And, you know, so there's a lot of stylistic uh, elements to her image that, that make her appealing to the native people. Like, for instance, she's brown. There's um, images on her garment that 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 are seen on other um, Mexica goddesses like Xochipilli, like the god of art, and I think dance. You 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 would know Machado um, Xochipilli. I'm glad you're here because you're like the master of all of this. Um, but but some of the flowers found on 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 that goddess's relics are are seen here on on, on her garment. So I, I just kind of, I wanted to create a composition that spoke to that history. Cause like, you know, like gr growing up um, first generation um, um, Chicano, like you, 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 you're surrounded by this iconography. And I just felt like there's also like looking at like the history of, of like the like colonial, like Latin American colonial painting I just felt like there's like a lot of room there to, to try to recontextualize those narratives and create new iconography so that people can have an entry point into learning their history. And that, 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 that's kind of my intention with, with like this recent body of work. But it all started, kind of, it all started with this painting. And, and um, 
So like previously, I, I feel like my interest in, in each painting were kind of all over the place. Like there, there's a chronology, like there's uh, like the colonial period and there's things that I look at that, but then like, I, then I'm also like looking at like the modernist period and like looking at the commodification of labor and just kind of the, the outcome of like the colonial period, like, like looking at how in our country, we saw a lot of that as progress, but for my, from my experience, working class doesn't really feel like progress, you know? So that, that's like another aspect that I was exploring in other work um, that was all mixed up. So my intention was to kind of just hone in on, on like one like topic. So right now it's like this, like, uh, like religious colonial, like um, concept. Slide. The next piece of art is a similar shade of red and brown. There are two halves. On the left, a common, commercial image of the face of Jesus wearing a crown of thorns, looking skyward. His mouth is covered with a different piece of art, a mosaic image suggesting an archer aiming a bow at the sky. On the right, the same piece of art, but this time, it's superimposed twice on top of itself, to create an effect of distance. This was like the, the next piece that, that uh, I made that's part of this series. And this one's titled um, 529 Years, basically the, the amount of years since 1492, which, which looking at the history, I know my focus is Latin America, and I know like the dates for that is a little later, like 1500s, but I'm still using 1492 as like an index for, for like just colonization of, of, of the Americas in general. Because um, um, I don't want to make it too confusing, you know? Um, so again, like go, going back to um, my interest in commercial art, like I gravitate towards um, iconography that exists in popular culture. And also um, uh, in particular for, for, for these two, uh, th this is a diptych. And um, like the image you see in, in, in the back, that's actually what was produced by uh, like a printing company uh, like in the from like who that that existed from like the 1800s all the way to like early uh, 20th century, uh, and and uh, I'm trying to remember their name. I wrote it down in here somewhere, but it's like Eve something and Company, and it's like a print that they made. Um, so I was really interested that 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 image that is so commonly known what was produced by this commercial printing company, and then um, in the center. Um, is a story of Popo and Itza, who the, the, the work was also created by um, this artist, uh, Jesus Holguera, who, who uh, was, was also a commercial artist. Um, and I just felt like, uh, and another thing, like both of the works were kind of made in the same period. Um, so I just thought it was interesting how like both of these images, like juxtaposing them together um, has like a lot of charged meaning. So, so um, with, with the narrative of, of Popo and Itza, th th there's um, an aspect of the narrative where, where uh, Popo is like cursing the heavens. So I kind of see that as like a moment of, 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 of um, reflection on, on the colonial history and, and using that as like the foreground in this work and um, kind of like, like navigating that 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 convo with uh, the crosshairs, and um, so so in, in the image he's he's pointing his arrow to the sky. That that that's the narrative that I was talking about of, of cursing the heavens. Um, Jaime Munoz. And um, well, let me let me just go back and talk. Just if you guys are not familiar with the with the with the with the story of Popo and Itza, it's basically. Um, it's basically like another version of, of, of Romeo and Juliet, um, where, um, a Popo who, who was like a, 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 a Mexica warrior was in love with Itza, but di di didn't have the approval of, of her father and, um, was sent off to war in hopes that he would die there, you know? Um, and, um, her father um, um, told, told her that he died in battle and she, then, then she died of sadness. And then when he, when he returned, 
that that's when he was like scorning the heavens and, and that's like the climax of, of this narrative and it's just interesting because this artist that i mentioned jesus Huelguera, um he, he um he's kind of documented different aspects of that narrative and i and, and to me i just found this part kind of like like the, the climax of that narrative the artwork reappears and um i just thought it was interesting to kind of juxtapose them together and like re re recontextualize again like this religious iconography and say say a little more um uh and one last thing um there's two mountains and there's two volcanoes in mexico city that are supposed to represent them as well like there's a dormant volcano that's supposed to represent um itza and uh the active volcano is supposed to represent uh popo yeah um and um, I'm also starting to do something a little different in, 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 in this work too. Uh, like going back to my interest in, in commercial art, um, I, I was always really inspired by um, like artists like, um, um, man, I'm forgetting his name. Um, but he, he, did, he did a lot of like psychedelic uh, poster art and like used a lot of like opposite colors to create like Kind of like this like optical tension and i thought that that was like interesting like in that i always felt that that was interesting for him to do that because he was kind of like breaking the rules that they teach you in like graphic design you know like you what you want to use colors that are pleasing to the eye you know uh you don't want to you, you want to use fonts that are legible you know like he he was he was doing like the complete opposite of all of that. Five of the six speakers appear. And um, something about um, how like the colors create like this visual tension when you look at it, uh, I was very interested in. Cause I, I know in religious art, whenever there's like a visceral experience, like um, th that's that's supposed to be like, um, you're feeling like the grace of God, kind of like the with stained glass windows, when you go into a cathedral, I learned this in your class Machado, uh, when you go into a cathedral and you see the light shining through the stained glass, you're supposed to feel like the visceral presence of God. And uh, my intention in these works is to also try to create a, a visceral experience, but kind of like a, like a decolonial, like recontextualization of like this history, you know, and uh, just trying to like, like, um, yeah, basically do the same thing, but from like a decolonial gaze, you know. Um, um, his name is, oh, man, hold on. Jaime Munoz stands and moves out of frame. Oh, yeah. He um, returns. Uh, Victor Moscoso. Yeah, I just forgot his name right now. I think it's just because I'm nervous, but that, that's the artist that, that, that really influenced me. Slide. A piece of artwork split into two halves, both similar in color, brown and red. On the right, a stylized image of Mary holding a dead Jesus, similar to the sculpture, Pieta. On the left, a similar setup, but a female figure holding a male. Both images have a light blue overlaid picture covering the torso of the laid out figure. The light blue picture on each side suggests the main image on the opposite side. And then this was like the next work that I did where I'm, I'm basically doing the same thing, like finding two charged images um, where there's like, uh, like, like two narratives that are that are that are like close enough where I can juxtapose them together where you can like create like a narrative. So so again here like Michelangelo Pieta, another commercial artist, you know, commissioned to do this work. And then another another um moment in the narrative of Popo and Itza from from the artist Jesus Huelguera. And I just thought it was interesting how like like the the images are like emulating each other and i felt like he, like jesus was like doing kind of like what i was trying to do like like kind of hijack the like the imagery like the religious imagery but but placing like the brown body um so like that was kind of like my intention here too to like juxtapose these together and also create try try to create like this visceral experience again with with the uh, like the the focal points of, of the paintings and I feel like this one was like the most successful one. Um, like if you if you had a chance to see it in person, um, uh, if you look at it from a certain angle, it really it really does like an optical thing, you know. 
um, uh, the title, the title, the title of this work is uh, Tension. And again, um, I chose, I chose, I chose to use that title because, like, visually, I'm juxtaposing two images that that to me create a a, a tension, but then um, like also vi visually, there's like a tension too, like when uh, our eyes are seeing something that is uh, uh, challenging in terms of information where, where, where that, that would create like an optical effect, it's because it's, it's creating like a physical tension in your retina that, that's allowing you to experience like this like psychedelic experience, you know? And so that was like another reason why I decided to, to, um, to title it uh, Tension. Slide. Artwork appears. The background is a similar brown and red, depicting a 4x4 four four stacking of boxes, some of which have different industrial signs and symbols, such as caution, 9-foot, 6-inch high container or a graphic image of a ship docking. Overlaid is a light blue and gold image of a bearded head. Atop the blue and gold image is a perched bird. And then th these were, I actually made these um, like in the middle, uh, but I figured I would just kind of go with the... Uh, like I made them at the same time, but the but the the chronology seems better the, the way that I'm presenting it now. Um, so so this one's titled uh, um, Sh "Shipping Container Apparition Number One," and uh, again I'm I'm trying to like just continue with like the the the, the that's the same narrative, and like in it it's like a shipping container to me uh like represents kind of like this uh um idea of of of, of capitalism commodification uh but then also like w when you look at the history of like capitalism it's alongside like the history of, of like religion you know so i always felt that it's interesting like the, the, like th those two histories being juxtaposed together like you know, and uh, trying to create a composition that's kind of like um, saying something around there. I titled it um, um, "Shipping Container Apparition" because the the focal point in these are are a lot more abstract, and um, that that's another thing that I'm interested in, like the history of like apparitions uh, and how. Um, like, um, you know, if you guys don't know what that is, it's basically when, like, like it's basically when God or like a some type of religious figure, uh, like uh, appears in like an inanimate object or something, and then they say like, oh, like this is a, a, a like an act of God, like this is the presence of God, you know, and. Um, so I so I, I wanted to to like incorporate that into this work, which I'm not sure if you can tell immediately that this is um, like the like, uh, Christ, uh, but um, I kind of wanted it to be like not too, so obvious and like force the viewer to spend time with the work to to make that um, connection. Slide, a similar piece of art featuring a four by four stack of brown and red boxes. The word Western is displayed across the top row. The overlaid light blue and gold image is a mosaic. Green plants are sprouted around the bottom row. And basically this, this was like another work that I made um, that was part of these two works. But, uh, but both of these are, um, are gonna be part of a group show in, in Germany um, for a, a gallery a weekend. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that art fair, but so I made them at the same time. So the, like the, the compositions are, are like similar, but but these two are not uh, diptychs. They're not. They're not meant to. They're they're not seen as as one. They're separate works. And uh, basically, it's the same same concept with this one. Um, and uh, also, I I feel uh, like an aspect that inspired uh, these two works was you know my experience growing up in in Fontana because uh, that that was like a period in my life where. Um, where like my mom was really like religious, but then also I was around a lot of uh, like sh shipping containers and trucks because it like Fontana is kind of like a like a shipping port, you know. So I just felt like 
like th these two paintings are kind of like indexical of like that period in my life where it was like like both of those worlds like coming together and kind of influencing me in in this way that the, and that's pretty much it that's all, all of, like all of all of the recent work that i've been working on right now the six speakers appear thanks Jaime. can you tell us what the media is that you're working on in these paintings um all, all all of the paintings are um on wood panel and um they also have texture paste glitter and paper and then is it oil acrylic uh, acrylic Aerosol. acrylic oh, okay. acrylic yes rebecca trawick wonderful mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thanks so much for sharing about your recent work um i'd love mm -hmm. to open it up to questions of our guests john machado i i want, I want just to comment on a few things i mean i just uh, of course really uh, enjoyed seeing your development over the last decade or so uh, big, always a big fan of your work um you know having you and both your brothers in my classes yeah, um, able to go to pre-Columbian exhibitions with all three of you is just a wonderful. I think you see one of your brothers works on the wall right behind my head. Actually, oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, it's you've become, uh, in addition to uh, the visual arts that you create, you become a historian, a, a cultural storyteller. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's very important for the intersection of everything going on in the empire, your background, and, and everything that you've learned over the last decades. So it's, it's really beautiful to see all that come together. Uh, in your work and and as rebecca said you're coming back to chafee to speak and and as you did uh, three years ago you did an exhibition for my nonprofit, the arts area in mm -hmm. in um, ontario you know in the midst of you're preparing for exhibitions on both coast and internationally and you still took the time to put an exhibition on back here in the Inland empire um because that you're you know, you're looking you're like you say you're indexing your uh understanding of your uh, pre-Columbian, your colonial, your modern history, but also your physical history, your connections to the Alien Empire, now overlapping with all of these art centers as they're uh, more commonly identified, but recognizing the amount of creativity that we have here locally too. So anyway, I just wanted to comment on that. Uh, thank you for everything. And uh, I always enjoy seeing your, your new work. Jaime Munoz. Thank you, John. Oh, I, I see, I see a, qu a question here from, from Ire. Yes. Uh, I, I just want to say hi, Edith. Um, it, um, it's been a long time since I worked with her. I remember I, I worked with her in the Wignall, but she was asking me um, if um, she that she's reading the painting through an environmental lens too. And and I'm, I'm I'm happy she's saying that because that that's something that I think about when um, you know when you look at the 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 history of of colonization. And then leading up to um, like the modernist period, like like all of those capitalist modes of of progress that we've seen for so long as progress is like kind of catching up to us now, whether whether it being um, like humanitarian issues or environmental, you know. And I, and so that that is definitely something that I think about too. And um, I didn't mention this, um, but with the last two paintings, um, the shipping container apparitions, another thing that I, that I, that I liked about um, um, ab abstracting uh, the image of Christ was also that they, they looked like um, uh, maps. So, um, what, so, so thinking of the map, I'm, I'm also kind of thinking of the globe and I and I and I do think of like environmental issues too, alongside with like the humanitarian issues that that modernism has like brought us to. You know, it's just it's just interesting. Like 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 people have been disposable. You know, that the commodification of human labor is apparent, but like like we only have like one Earth, and like like that that isn't disposable. Like we fucked that one up once, and we're it's fucked, you know, and um, and I, that that's where I feel we're at, we're at where where we're at right now, like in terms of climate, you know, like it's like it all kind of, it's all like uh, catching up to us, you know. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense, but anyway, I just wanted to kind of comment on on Edith's um, um, observation. Yeah, thanks. Oh, another another person said, uh, "What made you switch from graphic design?" um commercial art to fine art oh um um it, honestly it was um mitchell syrop 
Yeah, uh, because he was my graphic design teacher and uh, um, all the way up to the end of of my time at at Chafee, like I was like ready to transfer to a a university, the university to finish my degree in commercial art. But then I, you know, I did the the student invitational Mm -hmm. and he was like, hey, I I think you should reconsider and um, uh, apply for fine art, you know? But I was always really hesitant because coming from my background, working class, like like it it's it's a big decision to to choose to do fine art when like when you're when you're thinking of like your livelihood you know it's a big gamble um so the the closest thing that i that i felt i was able to pursue that that would um gain me economic stability was was commercial art you know i felt like oh like that seems more practical you know um but um, Mitchell convinced me like to to at least try to apply to at least one school for fine art, and uh, and um, he con- he convinced me to apply to UCLA, and that was the only school I applied to. And I was like, well, if I if I get into there, then then I'll do it. If I don't, then I'll just continue in the path that I was on. Um, but but uh, it it was a uh, it was a. Uh, um, a spontaneous decision, you know? Andrew Hadel. I, I was thinking maybe I could bounce off that uh, topic that you're just running with right now uh-huh. uh, with another question, if you're all right with it. Um, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, so, you know, as a former Chapey student, you know, a product of community college, if you will, um, do you have any advice for, for young artists or any of our, you know, okay. graduates or creative minds? Jaime Munoz. Okay. Um, um, yeah, yeah, I, I think I think that's a very imp- important question um, um, to to ra- to raise for for other uh, creative creative people. Um, you know, I, I have uh, two younger brothers who are also like in interested in in the creative world, and like I always tell them like um, just like really be true and honest to yourself in what where your identity is at you know like if you feel like um how can i say it like um like like wh- whatever you feel is going to bring you um satisfaction in life like uh, uh, like naturally without any expectation you know, and I, and, and I do, and I do understand once you commodify that joy, it, it, it changes your relationship to it. But I feel like that gives you like a head start into success. Cause like, you're not really forcing yourself to like be somewhere where you don't belong, you know? And, um, and like that, that's kind of like the advice that I give my, my brothers, you know, like, you know, like wh- whatever you decide to do, what, whatever path you choose to be on, like it's gonna it's gonna require a lot of discipline, you know, because like t- talent doesn't take you all the way, you know. Like, like we, we live in a system, and there's a way things go, and and not everyone gets the same opportunities. Like sometimes it just matters where you're at, you know, where where you get an opportunity, you know, and um, and um, yeah, just um, talent doesn't take you all the way. It requires a lot of discipline and hard work. But if you're not willing to stick around during that period of of, of uh, sacrifice, then then find find whatever 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 f- find the thing that you're able to to I guess um, be more comfortable making sacrifices for I guess you know what I mean um, and uh, yeah I mean that that's what that's what I would say yeah. Rebecca Trawick. We're probably all tired of talking about the pandemic, but uh-uh. <laughs> I really uh-huh. do think it's interesting. Um, you know, we've talked to so many artists and for yeah. some folks, it's literally like completely changed their practice. And for other people, it's just maybe given more studio time or, it ha- you know, it hasn't become a focal point or even a sort of underlying yeah. um, subtext. So I'm curious to know how the last year plus has affected or not affected your practice. Jaime Munoz. It hasn't really affected it. Like I've already kind of lived a lifestyle in solitude, <laughs> um, working in the studio. Um, um, but it, but, but it, it definitely has impacted um, how I relate to the world in terms of, of like death. You know, like I have been thinking of, of like death a lot more. And maybe that's the reason why I've been focusing on like this, like, 
like decolonial, like spiritual, like vein in my work. I don't know, but but um, I have been thinking about that a lot. And I and like there was a period during the pandemic where I got really sick, where I thought I thought I got I had a uh, COVID, but but it it wasn't you know. But that that was kind of like like a, a like a reality check where it was like oh man like this is scary you know because I I was experiencing the symptoms of it you know and I and I really felt like I had it but it it it, it wasn't that um so yeah j- just in the sense of thinking of like um like just de- death, you know? <laughs> yeah. Rebecca Trawick. I think it's on everybody's brains quite uh, yeah. before, right? Than, than yeah. the past. Um, but I wanted to ask about your um, inspiration that you derive from uh, Toya Terria. Am I saying oh, okay. That? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm curious oh, yeah. to know, I know hmm. it, we may not see it in your current body of work, but I'm right. curious how it um, translates into your practice. Uh, Jaime Munoz. Uh, so it's a uh, Toyoteria, you know. So um, like go, going back to my background, um, like working class, you know. Um, like I I grew up around uh, working trucks, you know, and um, like my mind my mind shifted there when I did this uh, video piece at, in UCLA. Where I, where I was juxtaposing the image of a, of a horse and a pickup truck like running in like a landscape. And at the time it, um, that work was more intuitive, you know, like, I, like it just made sense somehow. And then um, after I made it, that's where like the meaning kind of started like developing and um, like a big inspiration and in where that conversation went was a conversation I had with my grandfather where um, he was talking to me about his experience with um, modernism catching up to his pueblo, where, where he's from in, in, in Jalisco, Mexico. And seeing the transition of when people stopped using the horse and started using machinery a lot more, you know? And so the conversation was around the technology of it, you know, but then also seeing human labor as a form of technology that's been commodified, you know? And when you look at like like that early modernist period, like there's like that that's like the early history of like civil rights period or working class history, you know, um, where where you know it's like a history of the mechanization of labor, you know, where like like whatever human that exists in a human being is like taken out to standardize the production, you know, and and like that history always resonated with me. Because uh, like you, you, you feel that, you know, like when, when you work, um, like I used to work in construction and warehouses. And when you have certain jobs that are like that, where you just feel like there's like no acknowledgement of like your human being and only the only thing valuable is like the labor you produce, like it, it impacts you, you know, like you feel like a machine, you know. So I always felt like um, using like that pickup as like an index for that was like interesting. Cause like it, it's, it's to me, I see it as like a, like a portrait, especially when like um, you're driving behind one of those pickup trucks, like they're, they're, they're um, fully decorated with, with little stickers and things on the back. And like, it, it's just like a, like a window of like, uh, the 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 identity of the person driving it, but then also like the 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 work truck itself serves like as like an identity, an aspect of that identity, a window, you know. So um, so like my intention was to like use that as like an index for like like my critique of like modernism and exploring conversations around the commodification of labor and like just kind of building that conversation with the pickup truck. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. Andrew Hadel. It's obvious that you put a lot of time and thought into the compositions that you're painting. Yeah. Um, and I noticed with at least the ones that you've shown and some of the ones I've seen on your website, uh, your paintings, uh, that is, that there's um, either kind of a cap 
sometimes a, a something that's on the bottom that's uh -huh. or even around the edges where there's a lot of patterning uh -huh. um, repetitive kind of colors and, and, and icons and stuff like that i was yeah. wondering if you have anything to say about that aspect of your gameplay. yeah yeah definitely um jaime munoz so again go, going back to commercial art and th there's there's a gray line here too because like depending on like what zone you're looking at like i'm, I'm really interested in, in um uh, decorative art um that exists in like like textiles or architecture and oftentimes when you think of decorative art, it doesn't serve a function really. But, but when you look at um, de the decorative art in textiles that, it, that exists in uh, Peru, for example, like that, that's a coded system of meaning, you know? So it's not only purely decorative. And um, even in some of the geometric um, patterning that I use in my paintings, sometimes that's not all purely decorative either. Like I know, um, for example, um, in, um, um, in Mesoamerican architecture, like you'll see like geometric patterning and, and like there's like, there's one that looks like a G. And like I learned um, that in some street gangs, like th they, they've adopted that, that pattern that that's supposed to um, symbolize like a rank in like a gang. So like so like things like that, I'm like very fascinated about like like because there's an existing conversation of decorative art, but I, but I don't feel like there's a, a balance of conversation of like that it's not purely just decorative, you know, like sometimes it, it's serving some type of function in my work in my work. It is just decorative like like I'm not, I'm not really referencing that history or trying to go there. I'm just really inspired by the beauty of it and you, and and using it as a, as like a, a decorative element to frame the work. Um, um, but but I am interested in in those conversations. But it's they're not like central points of like my themes or anything like that. Yeah. Roman Stolenberg. Can I ask you a question about? Um... Yeah. Your color palette for this series in particular. Uh -huh. I mean, it's very. Um, so you mentioned talking about the way that you know the kind of the tension between the kind of the contrasting colors, but uh -huh, um, yeah. specifically very red. Yeah. Um, is okay. there you know has that long been a particular color palette that you're interested in, or in this series are you particularly kind of focusing in on, you know, it's a very you know it's a blood like it's a very specific kind of color yeah. palette. So I was just curious how you kind of choose. Choose your palette and stuff like that. For sure. Jaime Munoz. So, um, like, I'm really into like working with like a, like a mon monochromatic like aesthetic or color scheme, and um, so like for each ind individual work that I work on, like that's something that I think about. But recently, I've been thinking about like the aesthetic of of an, of an entire body of work. And um, so, for example, um, uh, my recent solo show at the Pit, like after I, I looked at the whole body of work, it, it didn't really seem so monochromatic anymore. Cause like what, like one painting would be blue, one painting would be red, one painting would be so. So also too, I felt like um, it would be interesting to like go off of that uh, based on the theme that I'm focusing on. So so that first painting that I showed you guys mother it kind of like dictated what color I was going to continue with since like that was like the focal point of the series I was like okay that that was the focal point of this of this series so so I'm going to continue with red and then maybe later when I'm when when I catch up when I continue in the chronology of my interest when I go reach up to like the like modernist period and looking at com the com labor and all of that like that'll be a different color you know and um so that's kind of like the way I'm designing it in my mind. Uh, uh, but other things that have inspired me around that, um, uh, like uh, definitely um, like the silk screening uh, posters from, from Victor Moscoso, a lot of them were like monochromatic in that way. Uh, but also, um, do, you, do you know um, these um, um, San Marcos blankets? 
they're like Mexican blankets of like a lion of like animals or or like plants. And like usually they're like all it's like all one color. I don't know if you've known or seen seen those, but but uh but like that that um ha, that's like that has inspired me too, like just aesthetic, like what that looks like. I've always been kind of drawn to that, you know. Rebecca Trawick. I mean, you mentioned a few artists who inspire you. I'm curious if you could um, tell us who who else you're interested in today, and uh, maybe oh. some artists you'd like to amplify. Yeah, uh, Jaime Munoz. A contemporary artist that 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 really inspire me today. Um, definitely, um, Rafa Esparza, who's a performance artist. He, he's he's been a big inspiration. In, in terms of the, the, the like similar themes that he's exploring. Um, uh, technically, another artist that, that is a big inspiration is Mario Ayala, who, who is uh, an airbrush. He also works with the airbrush, but he's like, he's like a master airbrush painter. And I also work with airbrush. Um, he, he's, he's a big inspiration. Um, who else? Um, I mentioned uh, Victor Moscoso. Uh, I've also been really inspired by um, um, this Japanese um, commercial artist. Um, his name is um, Tada, Tadanori Yoko. Yoko, I, I think I'm pronouncing his name right. Um, um, he's been a big inspiration too. Um, and then again, like just like looking at a lot of la like Latin American colonial art, like that's inspiring too yeah rebecca trawick so neil yeah. asks how is your art received in latin america and europe jaime munoz um well i re i recently uh so that the work uh 529 years uh, the the image of of, of christ with the thorns and poponitsa um that was shown in in madrid in spain and uh, I'm not sure what um, the like critical discourse of that work was, because I wasn't I wasn't there. But uh, I know it was received well. Um, but I'm curious to I'm curious to know, like, what critics or like the can like people who contribute to the canon of art would say, specifically since like since I'm specifically speaking of a history. In, in those uh, zones, you know, um, but I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how how it's received. I haven't read anything or heard of any anything, any response on 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 any of my work from out there. I I just I'm just barely starting to show uh, internationally. So maybe maybe next year I'll have a better idea of 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 how people are are receiving my work out there. Yeah. Andrew Hadel. I have a question that kind of bounces off one of Rebecca's earlier questions. And it's um, aside from artists that you enjoy and you look at, is there any media that you're consuming right now um, that you could kind of like be like, this is really kind of move, moving my art forward? Is it just television, books, uh, mm -hmm. in, any of that kind of stuff? Um, Jaime Munoz. It's hard to say because I, I I I have a tendency to jump around a lot of a lot of books, you know. Um, two of them, I'll say two. Um, one of them is um, a catalog from LACMA, and it was a, a an exhibition that they had on on Mesoamerican art in the '70s. And it's a really nice catalog that has really like beautiful images and really like thorough explanations of each image. Uh, of of well not the images of of the artifacts you know um, that's that's one that I've been that I've continuously been sourcing and then also to another catalog um, also from LACMA um, it was the uh, painted in Mexico exhibit it was um, a show on Latin American colonial art so I've been I've been th those two books have been kind of like on my work bench and I've been kind of looking at that a lot yeah 
Rebecca Trawick. Okay, I know we're nearing the end of our time together, so I really want to thank you for your generosity. Uh, we're grateful to have you back at Chafee and spend some time with you. Yeah. I want to uh, also thank everyone who attended today and carved out a little space in their calendar to hang out with us. We appreciate you. The survey screen appears again with a link. HTTPS colon slash slash tiny URL dot com slash Wignall Spring 21 Visitor Survey. And Roman will put in the chat a link to a very short survey. We'd appreciate uh, two minutes of your time. If you wouldn't mind completing that, uh, we'd greatly appreciate it. The six speakers appear. Huge thanks to you all, uh, particularly you, Jaime. Uh, wonderful to see you. Well, to th thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Great. Well, we can't wait to see what comes next. So thanks again. Uh -huh. And everyone, please take good care. All right. Likewise. See you. Text and logo, Chafee College. Wignall Museum of Contemporary Art. Home edition, with a graphic of a house.